Okay, we'll go ahead and get started so I can get the housekeeping business out of the way here. Um, but I want to take a moment to welcome everybody um, to the um, Family Medicine Grand Rounds for today. Um, it is partnered with the South Central AHEC, and you can see our mission statement there. Um, also, we want to really re-emphasize to everybody, I know not everybody needs to but if you could please um, use the QR code to sign in, we are trying to track our attendance um, for programming purposes. So please, please uh, sign in. There's also for those here in person, there's a little half sheet with some QR codes on there. It's gonna be the one in orange to sign you in. Um, so if you can help us out with that. Um, if you are claiming CME credit, the code is listed here for you. Um, make sure that you do send that, text that to the um, toll-free number before midnight tonight in order to claim your credit. Um, if you have not yet registered for a CME account, you'll need to do that first. Um, you'll just send your email address to the toll-free number, and then from that point on, you'll be able to register for a credit. But you can definitely um, contact me if you're having any trouble with that. I will also, for those who are on Zoom, I'll be putting that information in the chat box uh, periodically. If you are claiming credits, make sure that you do check the CME office website um, periodically to make sure that those credits are showing up on your transcript. But of course, any questions, you can um, contact them or you can reach out to myself as well. We also wanna make sure that you are aware that if you're an AAFP member, um, you can claim credits to their organization also. So don't forget about that. And it is our goal to meet these nationally um, established physician core competencies that you see listed here. And we need to mention that none of our presenters have any financial relationships with ineligible companies to disclose. And they are going to give us a presentation today on the AFP poems, on predictive values for six common abdominal symptoms. So I will let them get started with Dr. Tariq. Thank you so much. Hello. 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 Okay, so we start by talking about our objective. So we're going to summarize and talk about predictive value for six common abdominal symptoms. We're going to describe the finding of the retrospective population-based cohort study, analyze and discuss result of the study based on calculation of predictive, a positive predictive value of cancer, IBD, and either cancer or IBD, and indicate the part, um, practical application of study results. Um, as you may know, in primary care, it is difficult to assess new abdominal symptoms because around one in 10 patients have at least one symptoms, either abdominal pain, change in bowel habits, or bloating, and there can be many causes. When cancer is a possibility, there are different tests for different types of cancer. For um, We can do colonoscopy for colorectal cancer, we can do CT scan for pancreatic cancer, and ultrasound for ovarian cancer. If the symptoms have a high chance of being cancer, over 3%, the National Institute of Health and Care Excellence, NICE, guideline recommend a fast specialist assessment through a two-week wait pathway. So they mean if the patient has the abdominal symptoms and you're concerned about either cancer or inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's disease, or ulcerative colitis, you should be contacting the specialist within two weeks. And during this presentation, we would hear a lot about positive predictive value. So here I would like to mention what positive predictive value is. Uh, this statistical measure used in medical diagnosis to de determine the likelihood that a positive test result um, actually represent the presence of a disease. And positive uh, predictive value is calculated as a proportion of individuals with a positive test result who actually have the disease among all individuals who tested positive. So the past studies on the relationship between abdominal symptom and cancer have been limited as they only look at um, one type of cancer and ignore that the same symptoms could indicate different type of cancer. Uh, cancer and inflammatory bowel disease, most common as I mentioned, also the colitis and Crohn's disease often present with similar symptoms, uh, making it important for prompt 
diagnosis and referral to specialists. As I mentioned, they're focusing in two weeks pathway, so they want us to refer the patient to the specialist. And this study aims to estimate the predictive values of common abdominal symptoms in primary care for cancer, IBD, and both combined with a focus on values exceeding 3% threshold used by NIC to determine the need for specialist assessment or investigation. So this study used health uh, record and data from a UK primary care database uh, called THIN, which is the Health Improvement Network, to look at the relationship between abdominal symptoms and cancer or IBD. The data includes information on patient um, that they had symptoms from 742 um, general practice, um, GP practices covering 6.2% of the UK population. The researchers used the list of six abdominal symptoms, which Dr. Garcia would later show you on a chart, how, um, what are those symptoms? And co they collected the data from those patients between 2000 to 2017. The inclusion criteria for the study were patient had to have a record of an abdominal symptoms of interest at age 30 to 99 between 2001 and 2016 with no previous diagnosis of cancer or IBD. So as we mentioned previously, the study looked at six abdominal symptoms as exposure. The three main outcomes were a diagnosis of cancer, IBD, of both cancer and IBD in the year following the consultation. The researchers considered different types of cancer, including those that are affecting um, abdominal area or the organs nearby, and also IBD. Other factors considered were the patient's sex and age group. They divide the age group into 30 to 39, 40 to 49, 50 to 59. 60 to 69, 70 to 79, and 80 plus year, which Dr. Garcia will also show you on the chart. The study analyzed the likelihood of positive predictive value of having cancer, IBD, or either of them within a year after the patient had an initial visit with symptoms related to abdominal symptoms. They look at each symptom separately and also in combination with other symptoms if recorded. They calculated the positive predictive values for different type of cancer and for men and women separately by age group. The only presented result for colon, colon cancer, rectal, esophageal, and also non-abdominal cancer to avoid a small number of um, uncertainty. And I will pass it to Dr. Garcia, who's gonna talk about the result of the study. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. I don't know how to use it. Okay, so I'll be going over the results. Um, so this table shows a composite of um, all of the results that they got and it divides it into different symptoms. So the six symptoms that they were looking at were abdominal bloating and distension, abdominal pain, change in bowel habits, um, dyspepsia, dysphagia, and rectal bleeding. Um, except for rectal bleeding, it was predominantly women across the cohorts, um, and they ranged from 50% for rectal bleeding to 73% for abdominal bloating and distension. Um, as you can see, the median age at the time of the index consultation ranged from 52 years in, a, in the abdominal pain cohort to 63 years in the change in bowel habit and dysphagia cohorts. 
um, for abdominal pain, change in bowel habit, dyspepsia, dysphagia, and rectal bleeding, the large majority, um, about 87 to 99% of the patients had just that one single abdominal symptom recorded at their initial consultation. And typically 75 to 92% um, did not have any previous consultation for any of the other studied abdominal symptoms in the previous year. For abdominal bloating and distension, we see the opposite happening where 66 of all the patients had at least another abdominal symptom recorded at their initial consultation and 75% had at least another abdominal symptom recorded either at their initial cons consultation or in the previous year. Um, and most frequently that symptom was dyspepsia. So I know it's a lot. Um, this study had a lot of data. So I tried to condense it into a more digestible form for this presentation. Um, so this is basically what I just said. So I'll go ahead and skip this slide. Um, so the positive predictive value for cancer. Um, in men, the positive predictive value for cancer was higher than those for IBD for all of the abdominal symptoms. Um, across all six of the cohorts, 1.41 to 4.64% of men and 1.03 to 2.46% of women were diagnosed with cancer the year following that initial consultation. For each of the studied symptoms, um, the positive predictive value for cancer was higher in men. Changes in bowel habit, dysphagia, and rectal bleeding were the three symptoms with a relatively higher positive predictive value for cancer. And so they put it into this really nice table. And as you can see, the, can you see my mouth? No? Okay. Well, as you can see, as uh, the patient gets older, um, there's a higher predictive value for um, dysphagia and, uh, I'm sorry, change in bowel habit and the rectal bleeding for men and for women. Okay, the positive predictive value for IBD in comparison to cancer, those um, for IBD remained similar across all of the age groups and they exceeded the positive predictive value for cancer in younger age groups, mainly ages 30 to 49. In women, the risk of IBD exceeded the risk of cancer when, the cha when change in bowel habit and rectal bleeding were present. And so you can see that the positive predictive values um, stay pretty similar across all age groups, like I just said. Um, and then change in bowel habit and rectal bleeding are still the higher um, predictive values. The positive predictive value for composite of either cancer or IBD. Um, so risk for both cancer and IBD were influenced by whether a symptom was in combination with another symptom. For example, abdominal bloating distension in men had a positive predictive value um, for cancer of 1.65 and increased to 2.53% when associated with abdominal pain. Furthermore, the highest positive predictive values were those who had both changes in bowel habits and rectal bleeding. Um, the risk of cancer or IBD in those ranged from 5 to 8%. And this also puts it into a plot form. Okay, so this table and the next three slides show the number of incident cases and positive predictive values for cancer in the year following a studied symptom. And they put it into um, cancer sites. So we see colon, rectal, kidney, stomach, um, and it's divided into sex. And then we also have lymphoma, esophageal, pancreatic, sarcoma, and in women, ovarian and uterine sites that they studied. Um, so although cancers diagnosed following certain abdominal symptoms were mostly accounted by, 
um, a specific cancer site among patients who were diagnosed with cancer after presentation with abdominal pain and dyspepsia, there was a diverse range of primary cancer sites involved. So understanding the relative risk of possible cancer sites can help guide um, optimal testing strategies and then support our diagnostic decision making regarding the use of primary care tests such as a colonoscopy fit um, and further imaging. Okay, so I know that was a lot of data, so I kind of condensed it. So um, the changes in bowel and rectal bleeding can make you think colon rectal cancer. Dysphagia was mostly associated with esophageal cancer. Abdominal bloating and distension in women mostly linked to ovarian cancer. And then abdominal pain and dyspepsia had um, relatively low positive predictive value with a broader range of different cancer sites. Some of the study limitations include um, needing to work up additional features in risk stratification, other presenting features, comorbidities, family history. Um, also, these findings were based on general practice consultations within the National Health Service in the UK, which is characterized by a well-developed free point of access primary health care system with a gatekeeping function. Um, these findings may not be applicable to other health systems such as ours where social determinants of health such as financial or structural barriers to access, accessing healthcare exist. So the outcome, um, using a cutoff of 3% from the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, dysphagia or change in bowel habits in men and rectal bleeding in women should trigger referral for further workup to exclude cancer or inflammatory bowel disease. Symptoms such as abdominal pain, changes in bowel habits or dyspepsia in patients older than 60 years should be investigated because they predict cancer or IBD in more than 3% of men and women. That's a level um, ed evidence 1B. And for practice applications, specialist referral decisions can be made considering the predictive values of common abdominal symptoms for cancer alongside that for IBD and the composite outcome of either cancer or IBD and jointly assessing the risk of cancer or IBD can better support decision-making and prompt diagnosis of both conditionings, conditions, enabling specialist referrals or studies, um, particularly of women. Um, and just like Dr. Talui had said, the UK has a special two-week track system where if these patients present with these symptoms, they do require an urgent consultation within two weeks. So that's also another limitation for us is that um, when we refer our patients out to specialists, it can take up to months before they're actually seen. Investigation strategies and use of diagnostic modalities can be guided by the stratification of risk of different abdominal symptoms for different cancer sites. So the summary of our main points. Um, so this study used anonymous data from the primary care records in the UK. The study examined, it, examined the predictive value of six common abdominal symptoms for cancer overall and for specific cancer sites, as well as IBD. Change in bowel habit and rectal bleeding had the highest pr positive predictive value for colon and rectal cancer, dysphagia for esophageal cancer, and abdominal bloating and distension in women for ov ovarian cancer. The highest positive predictive value for abdominal pain of either sex and abdominal bloating distension in men only related to non-abdominal cancer sites. For diagnosis of either cancer or IBD, the predictive value of rectal bleeding exceeded the current guideline recommended risk thresholds for specialist referral in all age sex strata, as did the predictive value of abdominal pain, change in bowel habit, and dyspepsia in those age 60 years and over. Here's our references. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Uh, hello, this is Dr. K. I have a couple questions. Question here. Okay, Dr. we can K, hear you. we miss you. Yeah, just <laughs> I wish you were here. I wish you were here. 
Do you really miss me or you're just saying that for the TV audience? No, I definitely miss you. <laughs> All right, I have a couple of questions. Did this study, in addition to the predict, positive predictive value, did they also present likelihood ratios? And to what extent, the second question is to what extent does this, does the population demographics reflect our patient demographics? So they did not do likely. Um, the first one is uh, part one of his question is, did they study likelihood ratios? And then the, how does the patient demographics of the UK compare to our patient demographics? Um, can we go back to the very first slide where it showed the patient or my results slide? So they didn't do likelihood ratio, Dr. K. It's just positive predictive value. Just positive predictive value. Okay, and then here are the patient demographics. So they really only um, show the age group and then the sex. They don't really give us any other specific um, demographics. Okay, so the reason I'm asking is that the positive predictive value applies to the population in which the test was done. Yes, so correct. If, there, if the demographics of that population are very dissimilar from ours, then the results of the study may not be applicable to our patient population. Yes, that's the correct. The likelihood ratio, on the other hand, is independent of the demographics of the population. So if they had presented that, then we could draw better conclusions from the study. Then you would be more impressed. Yes. <laughs> yes. You got it. <laughs> Any other questions, Dr. Cadenau? No, that, that's. Thank you, Dr. K. Mm -hmm. So I didn't hear, hear all of what Dr. Cadenau said, but uh, so I, I won't repeat too much of it. But, um, but I, my question was that if you, they had six symptoms, right? Six and, so, symptoms. and so it looked like, like they, if you have this symptom, your chances is this. If you have that, so did, did they do an analysis where they have, if you have like two symptoms, three? Yes. Yeah, so so like the positive predictive value increased if they had more than one of the symptoms present. Okay. Yeah. So I think that's, I mean, I think it's important to keep in mind. I, yeah. I, the, the, the main comment I was going to make is the whole concept of positive predictive value. I can guarantee you, well, the third years, this is going to be on your boards. And that'd be more than one question. On and that's, well, I guess that's true for everybody who's a family physician here. I mean, all of us got a big board here, right? So, um, so just keep that in mind and understand that. And, and then I think I didn't hear all of what Dr. K was saying, but alluding, he was at least alluding to the fact um, if, if you got one population and the incidence of disease in this population is one thing, then the predictive, the, the predictive uh, value of, of the finding is going to be different if the underlying percentage of people in the population that have the disease is different, right? So, so they, they, you'll end up getting a calculation on your boards about that. So you, I'm not going to go into it today because I kind of need a chalkboard to show you, but we have to have to explain it to you. Guarantee you'll get that. So anyway, um, <laughs> well, 25% of the time, the answer is C. So what Dr. Katerndahl was saying was um, that if they had calcula calculated the likelihood ratio, it would have been more applicable to our populations. But because we don't have their specific demographics, we don't know if our population matches their demographics, so we can't really apply the positive predictive value. There are other limitations, I believe, that one year is not very significant. For colon cancer, for sure, it's significant. You are talking about one year, I think the favorite is stage three or four of the colon cancer, and they were able to diagnose them. Agreed. Yes. Any other questions? Thank you, everybody. So I think we're good. If everybody could just also please um, take a moment, if you haven't signed in, I know I already said that. Um, also, if you can fill out the evaluation, I put it in the link for those who are joined on Zoom. So if you can 
give us some feedback on today's session. And then those in person, if you could use both QR codes there in front of you to help us out. Thank you everybody very much.